Praise the Lord and blessings to anyone who will be out there seeing this. This is the first in a monthly Bible study series on one glorious chapter of the Word of God, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, taken from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. I'm going to be speaking in the first one today, uh, first to give an overview as to why a, a small coalition of Christians were concerned enough about Christian engagement in the political sphere to create a Bible series on the powers and principalities and Ephesians 6. And then I'm going to talk specifically about what we can draw from the representations of the city of Sodom throughout the Bible. I want to look at Sodom as a political symbol, not simply as a moral symbol. So, first I want to thank the Lord and, and pray for blessings as we go into His Word, and I pray that good things will come out of this. Um, if anyone is on there on Facebook Live and wants to post any questions, you know, feel free to post questions or comments. I'll be glad to answer them. And bless all of you for being in the world that God created and for tuning into this. In Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus, he was writing to a church in one of the most prosperous and politically connected cities of the ancient world. Ephesus was uh, a city in Asia Minor where there was a great deal of money, there was a large cult of Artemis, and so he was writing to a group of people that he knew were surrounded uh, by tremendous wealth and tremendous power. So it's not surprising that he touches upon some themes in this letter that refer perhaps to uh, what the Lord expects from us when we engage in the political sphere. Now, the people who have organized this Bible study decided to bring this to the world's attention because we feel sometimes that often Bible studies in Christian churches seem to often arrive at a similar conclusion. It seems as though whether I read Paul's letter to the Colossians, uh, to the Thessalonians or Romans or um, the Galatians, very often the conclusion I get in church Bible studies is that we should be nice and that we should be good at our jobs and we should win people over to Christianity by showing people what great and kind and lovable people Christians are. But if we look at, I'm just going to read the first few lines of Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 6. If we look at this, there are also parts of Paul's message, and certainly throughout the Bible, that tell us that we have to engage in political corruption around us. Um, there's an acknowledgement in the sixth chapter of Paul's letter to, to the Ephesians that Christians live in a world that is full of people with agendas and with ill intentions and that they use uh, financial institutions, political institutions, civic and social institutions to try to get their way at the expense of the gospel and at the expense of the body of Christ. <clears throat> so first let me open up by looking at Ephesians chapter 6, the very first verses, it begins with a, a, a reminder that children should obey their parents and slaves should obey their masters. Now let, let me read this and then talk a little bit about why this appears before we get to the part about how we are supposed to fight against the powers and principalities. He says, children, obey your parents as you would the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of the heart as to Christ. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but as slaves of Christ. Do God's will from the heart. Serve with the good attitude as to the Lord and not to men. Now, um, we open up with this. This is a passage that has caused some discomfort among people because it, people look at this and they say it justifies slavery. And it clashes with, with what comes later when Paul says we should uh, fight against the powers and principalities and authorities of this world. But when we're looking at the case of Sodom, it's important to consider the transition at the beginning of the sixth chapter from the scenarios where Paul tells us we should obey and we should be obedient to the scenarios where he says that we're expected to fight and to engage and to resist. Um, if you are a slave and that is the situation that you're born into and you really don't have 
power over your circumstances. There's a certain leeway that Paul's letter gives you. It's almost as though you could interpret it. This is one way that I suggest as a possible interpretation. Um, it's a way of the Apostle Paul saying, look, we know that the situation are in right now leaves you no real options to resist or to engage the political sphere. So God will give you a pass on that. Do the best that you can under the constraints that are placed under you. It's why it follows the part about obey your mother and father. Those are people that you should obey because they're, you're born into a relation of submission to them. In the case of the city of Sodom, consider this. Uh, we first hear about them earlier in Genesis, in Genesis 13 and 14, when we learn that it's a prosperous city, that Lot, Lot pitched his tents towards Sodom and decided to live there so that he could be close to that prosperity, but that something goes wrong in Genesis 14. We know that there's a king of Sodom, King Bera is his name, and that he um, becomes subject to an oppressor, someone who ob obtains political power over many cities named Kadorlomer, and that the Sodomites rebel. But when they rebel, they fail in the rebellion, and they end up being invaded, and they end up being enslaved. So there was a period where they really didn't have any power over themselves. They didn't have the ability to resist the power of Cardolomer, and they had to wait for God to send them their freedom. And that happens in the form of Abraham, who raises an army of around 300 men, and they go and they rescue the Sodomites, and they free them from the slavery in which they find themselves. Now this is significant because later in Genesis, the Sodomites are confronted with their own sin and they are exposed for having engaged in a great deal of sin. But it's important to understand that in Genesis 18 and 19, when the Sodomites are exposed for engaging in tremendous acts of carnal de depravity, that they are free people at that time. That they do not have that leeway to say, slaves, we don't have any choice, we have to obey. The things that I'm being forced to do, I, I don't have any choice or any way of avoiding the constraints. They were free people, they had already been freed by the Lord, and so when the destruction comes upon them, the destruction is that much more severe because there is a, an implicit expectation that somebody in the city of Sodom should have stood up to the powers controlling Sodom and forced the city to back away from its own decadence. I bring this up to draw a connection in chapter 6 of the chapter of Ephesians so that you can kind of understand why side by side you have a passage that says you should obey your masters if you're a slave and then you have a passage in which Paul says this. He says, be strengthened by the Lord Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the ruler, against the authority, against the world powers, and spiritual forces. This is why you must take up the full armor of God so that you can on the evil day, having prepared everything, stand. If you are in a worldly situation where the constraints truly are so powerful that it would be impossible for you to fight against your situation, in a certain sense you can interpret the sixth chapter of Ephesians as saying God understands that you can't fight against what is being put on you. But if God in his divine providence has already given you freedom, which was the case of the Sodomites in chapter 18 and 19 of Genesis, then it is your obligation to God to repay him with the freedom he gave you by standing up against the authorities, the powers of darkness. If you have the ability to resist, you should resist. And it is a sin not to resist. It is a sin to go along when you are not really a slave. If you have freedom, that comes with a divine obligation. And that becomes significant when we look at what happens in the story of Sodom. Because here's what happens. After they're freed, Abraham uh, meets with the king uh, of Sodom named Bera, and also he meets the king of Salem named Melchizedek. Melchizedek, of course, will appear later in the Bible in the New Testament because Paul refers to Jesus as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So this precedent when Melchizedek uh, 
meets Abram is, becomes a, a typology or a type that then recurs later in the Bible. Now, what's significant here is that the king of Sodom, Bera, he wants to merely pay Abraham for the fact that he freed them. And Abraham says, I will not accept so much as a sandal strap from you because I don't want to say that the king of Sodom made me rich. The king of Salem, Melchizedek, thanks Abraham by giving praise to the Lord and making a sacrifice and giving it up to God. In a certain sense, Melchizedek acknowledges the fact that it really wasn't Abraham who freed them, but it was God. Okay, so the contrast between the way that the king of Sodom responded to the, the outcome of the war and the king of Salem responded gives us our first clues as to what went wrong in Sodom overall and why the end of the city would be so tragic. Because if in fact King Bera had at that time changed his thinking and realized that the freedom from slavery which he had just received at the hands of Abraham was really a gift from God then if he, had, if he had looked at it that way, then he would have understood that now he was a free man and he was obliged to run his city in a way that would be pleasing to the Lord. But instead, he only saw this as a private transaction, as something that he could pay Abraham, a mortal, for having given him his freedom. In a certain sense, if he had bought his freedom that way by paying Abraham, then he would be within his own rights to do whatever he pleases in the city of Sodom because the freedom of Sodom was something that he had paid for. And so he, was, he would be owner of it and he would be able to set the tone and um, set the guidelines for what was a proper way that when you receive a, such a glorious event of being freed from oppression or being freed from slavery, that you must first do honor to, the God, to God. And, and think in the way that Moses was thinking in the book of Exodus, where the first thing that you do when you get people out of slavery is you hand them the divine law. You give them a code of what is the proper way to dispense with your freedom. How is it that you behave? How is it that you act? And so many parts of your life are governed by that principle. Because think of the law that that Moses gives in Exodus. It includes honor thy mother and thy father. It also includes thou shalt not commit adultery. It includes your sexual behavior. Okay? But the king of Sodom, at the end of this, he doesn't do what Melchizedek does. He doesn't give honor to the Lord. And instead, what he does is he goes back to Sodom. He's spared the, the financial burden of having to pay for the fact that Abram freed them. And he goes and he enjoys his freedom on his own terms. And it doesn't end very well. Because in the 18th chapter of Genesis, we find that um, Abraham is visited by the Lord and two angels. It's a rare moment where the Lord actually appears physically to someone. Um, and they come and they inform Abraham that he is going to, um, that, that the Lord is going to destroy Sodom because its sin has become very great. So you already see a huge transformation in God's position towards this city. Um, when they were slaves, God had mercy on them and gave them you know, the chance to be able to gain their freedom and dispense with it well. Now that they're a free city, God is, is disgusted with the way that they're behaving. He bargains with Abraham and he says at the beginning, if there are 50 just men, then he will spare the city. And we see signs that Abraham is aware that something is going terribly wrong in the city because he starts bargaining lower and lower and lower until basically all Abraham is offering is that if he can find 10 good men in the city, that the city will be spared. Now what does this tell us? What does it tell us the fact that God engages in bargaining for Sodom, the fact that Abraham even suggests a lower price to be able to get spare Sodom's destruction, or the fact that it's so total that whatever evil is eating away at Sodom, it manages to consume everyone so that you can't even find 10 good men. What it really points to is the fact that the king of Sodom, Bera, has instituted a political system. And the political system has created a rot, a type of corruption through all of the institutions in Sodom. And we're going to see this in the details of what happens in Genesis 19 as well. That something has gone wrong and people have not been able to prevent whatever misguided behavior or distorted way of thinking had taken hold in Sodom, that it had spread through the entire city. So we see this when Lot goes to visit the city of Sodom, or when Abraham visits the city of Sodom. He sees that Lot is at the gate.
And that's a place where people usually who are respected in the community engaged in you know, either hearing complaints and trying to judge between competing cases, or they were able to bargain and engage in the business affairs of the city. So we see that law has already been integrated into the authority structure of the city of Sodom. When uh, Abraham gets there, at first, he and his two guests are going to sleep in the town square of Sodom. But they're warned at that point that no, it will not be safe for them to be in the town square. So what this does is all of this points us to the fact that Sodom is not only a place where people are engaging in sexual depravity, there's also a political problem in, so in Sodom. Its resources are being run in a way that it can't guarantee basic safety to people. Um, and that even people who are visiting and who are throwing themselves upon the mercy of the city are uh, not able to have basic security. Um, and so we see the first sign that Sodom is failing at different times because of the fact that it's a city with a large population and nobody is standing up to the authority. No one is challenging the status quo. They're letting it go on as it is. They're all minding their own business. This is why when Jesus Christ mentions Sodom in, uh, the, in the Gospel of Luke, he says, in the future, in the end days, it will be as in the days of Lot. Because Jesus describes the days of Lot as a time when there were people who were giving one another to each other in marriage, when they were drinking and they were, um, you know, they, they were enjoying all of their festivity and they didn't see the destruction coming. So ultimately, one of the first political sins of Sodom is ultimately the failure to reform and the failure to challenge the status quo. There was a lack of discernment because they couldn't even see that their, their city had collapsed into such total d depravity that two people wouldn't even be able to be safe spending one night sleeping in the city square. So there was a lack of action. There was an inaction. This kind of points us back to Ephesians chapter 6 when Paul says, look, you have to fight against the powers and principalities. You have to fight against the authorities and the dark forces in the heavens. Now, many people look at the story of Sodom and they say this is a symbol of God's tremendous wrath and his vengeance. But I would like to challenge that and say that God's mercy is on full display in the story of Sodom because he gave them at least seven chances that I can think of to show that they could dispense with their free will in a way that was proper. God first gives them the chance by giving them the freedom from Kedorlaomer. And then after that is done, King Bera saw the example of King Melchizedek and he could have honored God instead of trying to pay Abraham for the fact that the sandals were, uh, or, or I'm sorry, for the fact that he had been freed from slavery. Then later um, in, the, in Genesis 18 with the bargaining, we see that God had mercy on Sodom by setting the standard so low. He only needed 10 men, 10 men who would be able to stand up to the powers that be in the city. Then when they get to the city, if only someone in the city had been able to come forward and act and say, okay, if these people want to sleep in the city square, then let's do something to protect them in the city square so that they won't get attacked and abused in the city square. But even that, they failed to even meet that test. At that point, the Lord would have been fully within his rights to destroy the city right then and there, but he went on and gave them even more chances. Because then, instead of sleeping in the city square, where do the guests go to stay? They stay in Lot's house. So that's the fifth chance. If only the people would have left Lot's house alone, the city would not have been destroyed. But what does the story say that happened? All of the men, old and young, came to surround the house. All of them were there. They all witnessed the behavior of each other. And what happened? They said, send the men out so that we can have sex with them. All right? And the problem is that the totality of that, the fact that all of the people are part of the same political system and they're all part of the same culture and they're witnessing the depravity and the cruelty and the inhumanity being practiced by all of their neighbors and they say nothing 
This points to the sin of Sodom. I think it points, we're going to talk a little bit later about sodomy, the sexual act, and why that as a sin is, cannot be separated from the political sins. But we should also look at the political sin, which is a city in which, as Jesus Christ described in the time of Lot, everyone goes about their business and they don't attend to the basic ethical problems of the city. That's why in the bargaining it got down to 10 good men and they could not even pass that test. So they surround the city and at that point Lot says, no, this is a horrible thing to do, you can't do it. And what do they say to Lot? You come as a foreigner and now you want to play the judge and tell us what we can do and what we can't do. Okay, this gives you a lens into the thinking that got Sodom in all of this trouble. Um, they, they were arrogant and they felt that their way of doing things was best. It was perhaps, you could say, I don't know, a libertarian city or a libertine city, a city where the basic rule was that if everyone got together and they all decided that this was the way things were going to be done, that people could be thrown out and subjected to their depraved pleasures. But at any rate, Lot responds by even offering to send his two daughters out. Um, to be abused by the crowd. Something which is a disgusting thing, but it's noteworthy to say that even at that point, the crowd still demands to be able to rape the guests. And in the ancient world, of course, hospitality was something that was very sacred. In the ancient world, in the Greek uh, world, for instance, anyone who was a guest in a foreign place was under the protection of Zeus, and so if you abused a guest, you were abusing, you, know, you were violating the law of Zeus. So um, <clears throat> it was important to note that at that point they reject that. And then at the point where they press against Lot and they try to break into the house, then the Lord blinds them all. So even in their blindness, this is yet another act of God's mercy. If they had just realized, okay, I'm blind, maybe at this point I should stop. Maybe I should just give this whole thing a rest. They still grope and they still try to find their way there. At that point, Lot even says he's going to take his daughters out of, and his wife out of the city, and they, he goes to the sons-in-law, or the, the, the men who are betrothed and who are planning to marry Lot's daughters, and they won't go with him. So he has to drag his family out, and then as the last final blow, his wife can't even keep her eyes fixed forward, but she looks back and becomes a pillar of salt. So if you count up all of those chances, I, count, I come up with seven chances that God gave this people to avoid total destruction, and they rejected every single one of the chances. So the story of Sodom is really about God's mercy, but let's also talk about what could have possibly gone wrong in the city of Sodom that this would have spread to, to such totality? Um, the thing about it is that when we hear the term tolerance, we think that it's a good thing. When we decide that we're going to be non-judgmental, we're going to be open to other people's preferences, even if it offends our moral code, Sometimes here in the United States, in the open society that we live in, under the tradition of classical liberalism, we think that's a good thing. We think it's a good thing to basically let people do what they want to do. This is why homosexuality, as the, the issue has come up in our own society, we, it has gotten as far as it has because we don't want to interfere with people. We don't want to play the judge, which was what Lot was accused of by the people there. But the thing is that sin, depravity, things that God has said are wrong, are never things that can just be contained in one little part. And, of and the then city. five years later, we had an AIDS epidemic. The reality of the human body is just that the kind of sex acts that go on between men are, are harmful. None of our bodies, even though we believe that there are people who are gay, nobody's body is really designed to behave in that way or to engage in that kind of sex. And so you see the harm that is done. AIDS spread, at least in the Western world, much more quickly among homosexuals because the kind of sex that two men have leaves parts of their body open to infection at a much higher rate than heterosexual sex would lead. And because of the fact that the kind of homosexual sex that occurs uh, doesn't create the kind of monogamous inclinations that you have between a man and a woman. Male sexuality tends to be very aggressive, so you have two men and you don't have any woman involved to kind of slow things down, 
you tend to have more partners, you tend to have much briefer relationships, you tend to have open relationships, you, have, you tend to have relationships that are much more uh, focused on sexual behavior, okay? So it's a harmful act. And then what ends up happening? As we tolerate the harmful act and we see people dying of sexually transmitted diseases around us and we see people being unhappy, then because we were complicit in tolerating it, we now are kind of committed to continuing to normalize what they're doing and so we have to help them to cover up the basic fact that what they're doing is wrong and harmful and not a good decision. So what do we do? We start trying to change our institutions to make them feel like they're not excluded. And then when that doesn't work, because we still see the, the negative impacts of the sexual behavior, then we start expecting schools to teach this to people to make them feel better about it. We expect the churches to preach a different gospel to make them feel better about it. We expect the courts to not criminalize things that they do, which would be criminal if it were done in a heterosexual context. For instance, it would be criminal for um, a man who is attracted to women to go into a women's locker room and to show them that he's getting aroused, right? But a man who goes naked into a male locker room and who shows all of these men that he's aroused, that's not a crime. So you, you, you change the legal structure, you change the educational structure, you change everything because the, the, the range of things that you have to control in order to justify a sin that's unjustifiable becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And the result of that is your toleration does not lead to freedom, it leads to another form of slavery because you have to control more and more people's thought processes. You have to control more and more of what people say to one another, their speech, their conversation, their ideas, in order to reach the point where you can actually erase the fact that something that is harmful is harmful. So the story of Sodom is really the, the tragic story of what happens when a city abuses its freedom. Perhaps, I've thought about this quite a bit, um, I've wondered if maybe the problem with the people in Sodom is that they still thought of themselves as victims, even after having been freed. They didn't really ever get to the point where they realized that they're really responsible for their actions and they're responsible for holding their neighbors accountable. Maybe they were still had in the mindset of an invaded, colonized, and enslaved people. It's something to think about when we look at victim groups today who really like to complain about oppression by white males or by heterosexuals and then they don't really realize when they themselves are the agents of their own harm and that they are harming other people because ultimately if you invest entirely in a political system that harms you, you're also going to harm other people and, and you're, you're going to find that if you justify the harm that you're doing to yourself, you're going to become inactive, you're going to become powerless, and you are going to become unwilling to stop other people from harming other people. So it's a multiplier effect. So in this opening Bible study into Ephesians 6, I would say that the story of Sodom is closely related to Ephesians 6. Because what Paul is telling us is that if we are free in a society like the one in which we live, we don't have the option to tolerate evil or to tolerate sin. You can't. You have to stand up to it, especially when the sin is being carried out with the approval or the imprimatur or the backing or the sponsorship of the authorities. That is why he says to the people of Ephesus, you have to stand up to the authorities and the powers that be and the forces of darkness in the heavens, the powers and principalities. On the issue of sexuality, this has become an issue that has consumed much of our country right now. We see just in the last week some of the stories that have come down. There's the question of what happened when we accepted open homosexuality in the military. I'm going to tell you some, some facts. It was a lie that that was a smooth transition process. The number of assaults, sexual assaults, in the military, not only between men, but also between men and women, went up 
after the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. The suicide rate went up. Why is that possibly related? Well, because one of the things that happens when you get sexually assaulted is you get suicidal thoughts. <laughs> All right, so the military backed it, and we see this spread of suicide and destructive behavior and sexuality spreading in that way. The schools began to give this endorsement. First, we started to suppress any of the research at the university level that threw light on the destructive nature of homosexual intercourse. So people like Paul Church at Harvard lost his job because he basically documented, he was a urologist who had worked with thousands of, of patients, and he documented the fact that anal sex between men was very destructive to both partners. He lost his job because of that. There are other doctors who lost their jobs because of that. There are psychiatrists like Miriam Grossman <laughs> <clears throat> who had to walk away from prestigious positions. She was at UCLA because she couldn't deny the reality that this behavior is harmful. So the medical position, those authorities, the medical boards, the university deans, the provosts all over the place, they all bought into this lie and so the harm spread. Then it went down to the K through 12 level. We are now talking about what happened in Austin Independent School District where just this week they approved a curriculum that would involve teaching about anal sex. Really, I mean, it's going to be hard for the students to opt out. So the students are forced to hear about anal sex at ages as young as third grade. Mm -hmm. um, so this, it's spreading there. It's spreading in terms of the powers and principalities in the media and in, in Hollywood and in the press where all of them, they're all engaging in exactly what we saw in Sodom. They're, they're a crowd around Lot's house, seeing that abuse is happening right in front of their face. And they must have been aware in Sodom that the abuse was rampant, because the fact that the first thing they hear is that it's not gonna be safe to sleep in the city square in Sodom. That means that everyone in that town knows that the abuse is rampant, and no one's doing anything about it. Um, so, in, in matters of sex, sometimes it's easy to, to fall for this libertarian argument that what happens in someone's bedroom is nobody's business and that it, it, it's not going to affect you. But the nature of sin is that it never stays in the bedroom. You know, it, it hasn't stayed in the bedroom in this case. It's in the courts. It's in the hospitals. It's in the K-12 through schools. It's in the college and the universities. It's in the army units. It's everywhere. We're inching closer and closer and closer to that scenario where there might be fewer than 10 men in all of America who can actually see what is going on and stop it. I know because I've worked alongside many wonderful Texas mothers, like the ones who are working with me on this Bible study case, I know that um, I've worked with them. We've gone to Austin. We've, we've, <coughs> we've visited with Republican politicians who ran on platforms saying that marriage is between a man and a woman <coughs> who wouldn't help us, who basically said, it's not my business. I'm just going to stand back while Lot's house gets surrounded and the doors get knocked down. But we've got to be able to mobilize. And part of this means we have to be able to sort through the arguments. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he talks about not being deceived by vain and empty arguments. And I'm going to mention one thing, which might not be a popular thing to say, but it's something that I do want to bring up. The, the response from Christian conservatives has largely been to focus on marriage and the definition of marriage as between a man and a woman. I believe, obviously, that marriage is between a man and a woman, so I'm all down with that. But when we look at the larger scope of everything that is affected by the change in sexual orientation and sexual identity, Marriage is actually somewhat of a small part of it. And I say this when, when we think about Sodom, okay, because the problem in Sodom doesn't seem to be that they had homosexual yeah. marriage. The, the references to marriage that we get in the story of Sodom come from Jesus when he says that in the days of Lot they were giving one another to each other in marriage. And we know that Lot's daughters were engaged to men. So, and Lot had a wife. Um, you know, so basically it wasn't so much that they had changed the definition of marriage. It was the fact 
that they refused to acknowledge the abusive nature of the sexual practices and that everybody was afraid of speaking up and resisting the dominant cultural force. On that ground, if we look at that as the main problem with the changes in sexual orientation in our culture, I would have to say that conservative Christians haven't really stood up to that because I don't see them saying that schools shouldn't be teaching this. I don't see them really fighting against uh, the media or reporters when they say people are born gay. You know, part a lot of the, the rhetoric that you get surrounding the gay issue is part of the abuse. I mean, uh, people are, are, let's say, they're encouraged to experiment and then they are, they're initiated into gay sex at a young age when they don't really know what it means. And they're essentially groomed and abused uh, when you tell a child who's been through something like that, people are born gay and they can't change, that's part of the justification for what has happened to them. Because people, adults say that to them as a way of saying, well, you weren't really abused or forced. This is who you are. And we know because as a general principle, people are born gay. So if this was a, a, in Abuse. use as something that's normal sexual practice. Um, but for the most part, I find that the choices among many Christian churches is to, re is to fall back on their default, which is to look at the definition of marriage and to not want to deal with the abuse in this or the harm, the physical harm and the emotional harm. In a certain sense, they haven't really worried about the victims. And if we look at it that way, then I would have to say that Many of the Christian conservatives, even people who run for office based on the idea that they defend the traditional definition of marriage as between a man and a woman, they're still in the same position as the people surrounding the house because they're focused on a definition that really isn't addressing the severity of what's happening. The severity of what's happening is that you have a city that thinks it's normal to rape people, to abuse people, and you don't think that's abnormal. You think that that's just part of living in a city. This is part of what happens to people in the city. Um, if you don't have any compassion for the victims who, are, who fall into that, the people who are harmed by it, then even if you are going to fight over the definition of marriage, you're still in the position else. So it's important that to counteract what happened at Sodom you have got to fight against the powers and principalities. You have to fight against the ideologies that are false. You have to expose the rhetoric, expose the lies, and you have to always keep an eye on who is harmed by the spread of this ideology and the normalization of this sexual conduct. That means that in many cases, the people that you're most concerned with are the people who actually identify as gay because they've been deceived and they're being abused. They may not know it, but they're being abused. And the reason that they don't know it or they might not know it is that the system has been set up to completely blind them to what's really going on. They're, 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 they're caught in this city like Sodom that has worked on them through its propaganda and through all of its powers and authorities where they have allowed all of that to define who they are as a person. And if you can try to approach this issue with an eye to the victims and the people who are going to be harmed by it, not on the abstraction of, of how to define marriage or <clears throat> how can I avoid losing my tax exemption, you know what I mean, um, by, and, and still not have to perform marriages. All of those approaches to this issue really take the focus off of the victims. And that is one way that we can connect this with that passage from the 16th chapter of Ezekiel, which pro-gay liberals often cite to try to remove the issue of homosexuality from Sodom. In the 16th chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel says, the crime of Sodom was that they were haughty and arrogant and that they did not care for the poor and the needy in their city. Now, I've heard many pro-gay liberals who say, ah, oh, that's the crime of Sodom. It wasn't about homosexuality. But the point is that that is about homosexuality. Because if you do nothing when you see that an ideology like that has spread and people are being recruited into homosexuality, 
Those are the people who are referenced in that Ezekiel passage as the ones who are needy, as the ones who are poor, the ones who are humble or wretched or, you know, weak, and you need to protect them. And the problem in Sodom was the fact that nobody was worried about them. They were busy giving each other in marriage and they were drinking and all the stuff that Jesus said was happening in the days of Lot. So we want to avoid approaching the sexual morality issue in a way that kind of triggers what Ezekiel was talking about where we've lost our focus on the people who are victimized by it. But I still say that um, overall, the story of Sodom very much points to the need to be politically engaged with institutions because this is not a question of individual choice. It's definitely not the question of individual identity. This is a system. It's a political system that has normalized harm that has denied abuse, even when it's right in front of people, and that <clears throat> has squelched dissent, that has forced everyone in the position where they all own the guilt because they're watching it around themselves and they won't stop it. And remember that in the United States, we are a free people. We can't look to the beginning part of Ephesians 6 and say, oh, well, I'm a slave, so I have to obey my masters. We're not slaves. We're free. And so we're not the sodomites of Genesis 13 and 14. We're the sodomites of Genesis 19. So that concludes it. Does anyone here have any questions? People are brought into this, and, and they are... Um, uh, I would say drawn into a system that abuses them, okay? The first, and it's very organized, this is not something that's just random or individual, okay? The first step is you expose young people to explicit or suggestive images. So you force them to imagine homosexual activity. Number two, you overcome their inhibitions. Okay, so you reduce their inhibitions um, by hiding from them how harmful it might be and what the consequences might be. Number three, you increase their curiosity. You make more and more for them to want to be able to um, know what it's like, to, to, to experience it in the real flesh. The fourth thing is you encourage experimentation. Okay, you've normalized it. You, you present to young people the idea that this is common, okay? And then the fifth is kind of the, 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 the horrible gateway where you initiate them into the sex act, okay? And very often um, when you initiate people for the first time into homosexual sex, the bodily reaction is uh, negative because, I mean, it is something that causes revulsion in people just because of the anatomy of it. Um, but then you overdetermine, number six is you overdetermine their response to it. So if they reject the idea of this sex act, you, you kind of tell them, oh, you're not dealing with yourself enough. You, you haven't accepted yourself. You've got to do more work to accept yourself. The seventh is you isolate them from heterosexual culture. You try to draw them more and more to do things in a world where they're surrounded by other homosexuals or other trans people and they are not exposed um, to uh, heterosexuals. And then the number eight is you alienate them from heterosexual culture. Now that you've isolated them, you kind of say, you know what, you're never going to be able to get back into the straight world and they don't want you, they don't like you. Number nine is you make them feel hopeless. You basically make them feel as though this is not only normal, but this is the only possibility that they can possibly ever engage in, and they can't get out of it. And then number 10 is you just indefinitely exploit the fact that they're stuck. Now they're a captive in your community, and you use them for all of the benefits and anything that you want to get from the fact that you have this constituency. If you look at those 10 steps, you have to imagine all of the different institutions that are involved. They expose people through the schools, through the companies that make children's entertainment, that make cartoons, that make books, that make music, okay? Um, and then as you go along, the police are going to enforce laws about, um, you know, uh, let's say statutory rape in a way that allows a lot of this abuse to fly under the radar because what happens very often in LGBT communities is people who are 45 will groom the 18 year old, the 18 year old will groom the 16 year old, the 16 year old will groom the 13 year old and then so basically none of it is illegal but it's all abuse okay so the way that the 
the police are functioning, the way that the courts are functioning, the way um, that the schools are functioning, the way that the companies that make entertainment, all of these institutions, these powers and principalities are all involved in this process. And it won't work unless all of them are forced into the same situation. So then you have the medical schools that are training doctors to look at this process I just say and instead of seeing, oh gosh, this is a sick 10 step process of abuse and exploitation, they will look at that and say, this is the story of how someone comes out and comes to accept themselves and becomes a functioning happy gay adult. So you, you, all of these institutions are involved. Does that make sense? Um, and so we have to fight them in all, every step of the way because that's a big part of how this this is, is carried out. Yeah. Mm. Well, <laughs> thank you very much for the very first of this. Uh, um, ask your live audience online. Um, yeah, no, I think once that they said thank you. If love is oh, love of money is the root of all evil. Is the spread of LGBTism a natural stage of advanced consumer culture? Um, Giles Rowe, thank you. That's a very good question. I would say yes. Um, I would say, in fact, there is a, an essay I once wrote called Chaste is the New Queer, okay, in which I basically pointed out that when I was younger and, um, and I was pro-gay and I identified as gay uh, and I was really all into this, um, I was very drawn into the idea that to be queer meant that you were against the military industrial complex and you were against capitalism and you were against the corporations and you were against the government. In fact, uh, one great queer theorist once said that queerness must exist to smash the state and to smash the, the powers of the corporations, okay? Now, 25 years later, I look at this and I think to myself, why did I ever believe that? I mean, the LGBT community is on the side of the corporations. They're funded by Jenny Pretzker. They have the medical profession in their pocket. They have the military, the schools. Everyone is in their, their pocket. So I would, I would say that, um, that to a certain degree, um, uh, LGBT culture is an advanced state of consumerism. Mm -hmm. it, it is very much, and consumerism not in a way that shows the glories of capitalism and the free market. I mean, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a lack of character where we become so obsessed with um, advertising and consuming products that we lose sight of our own human dignity. And I think that LGBT is very much a part of that. It's, it's what some people would call late capitalism, you know, or late consumer culture. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're off. We're off. And we have a surprise person who's going to give that Bible study that you may have heard of. He's quite famous, and he's going to talk about um, what it means to stand up the, to the powers and principalities in Christian denominations. That's going to be taking place in November, and you don't want to miss that. Thanks. Mm -hmm.